In this video, I'm going to teach you a new radical reaction. The radical addition of HBr to alkenes. Now this is different from what I talked about in the previous video in which I discussed the radical addition of Cl2 or Br2 to alkanes. So please note that difference. Now as I've taught you before, back in like chapter 4 or 5 or something, when we add HBr to an alkene normally, what occurs is we get the Markovnikov product, as shown here. As you should remember, the electrons come out, grab the hydrogen. The hydrogen, of course, goes to the external carbon over here, giving me the more stable internal carbocation. And then the Br- minus comes into that carbocation, forms a bond with it, giving us this final product in which the bromine has ended up on the internal position. So what in the world happens if I take the same alkene and I treat it with HBr under radical conditions. And what are radical conditions with HBr? As it turns out, you can turn this regular boring HBr reaction with an alkene into a radical reaction if you add peroxide. So here's what it says. Adding HBr and peroxide, that is radical conditions to an alkene, gives you the anti-Markovnikov product. So if I ever wanted to put the bromine in the anti-Markovnikov position, these are the conditions that I would do. Now before going on, I need to stress one thing. This reaction does not work with HCl or HI. If you try HCl or HI with peroxide on an alkene, it, those actually give you the same old boring Markovnikov product. I'm not going to share with you why, but if you want to know why, please see the discussion on this subject on page 482 of our text. Now at this point you might be thinking, I understand why adding HBr to a regular alkene gives me the Markovnikov product. But why in the world is doing the exact same thing with peroxide added give me the anti-Markovnikov product? I thought you'd never ask. The answer, of course, is explained by looking at the mechanism. How in the world does this mechanism go? Well, if you add peroxide to this reaction, along with light and heat, what occurs is the peroxide, which has a generic structure shown here, breaks apart homolytically to form two oxygen radicals. These oxygen radicals then react with the HBr. As you can see, this hydrogen is stealing one of the two electrons in the HBr bond and taking that electron and combining it with this oxygen radical to form an alcohol and produces bromine radical. So the purpose of the peroxide addition is just to form bromine radical. These, of course, are the initiation steps of our mechanism. Now, what occurs next is fascinating. My bromine radical comes in here and reacts radically with the pi electrons in this carbon-carbon double bond. Now, keep in mind, as it does so, it's going to form a bond with the external carbon. And the reason is because, upon doing so, it places a radical on the internal carbon, which is the more stable location for a radical to be. As you can imagine, if this bromine formed a bond with the internal carbon, I would end up getting a radical on the external carbon, which would be less stable. So this is why the bromine goes on the external carbon. Because once again, it gives me the more stable internal carbon radical. What occurs next? Well, this internal carbon radical gets together with another molecule of HBr. The hydrogen steals one electron and walks over here and combines it with this carbon radical to form a carbon-hydrogen single bond and then releases bromine radical. These steps are my propagation steps. There are, of course, various termination steps that can occur, such as these two bromine radicals getting together to form Br2 or getting together with other radical species in this mechanism to ultimately remove all of the radicals out. I'm not going to show you any of those. Instead, I'm going to tell you guys a couple more details about radical reactions. Just so you know, radicals do not rearrange as readily as carbocations. If I took this molecule and reacted it with HBr under non-radical conditions, that is, without peroxide, I would, of course, see these electrons come out and form a bond with hydrogen, placing it on the external carbon, giving me an internal secondary carbocation. I would then see a 1,2 hydride shift to place the positive charge on my tertiary position before the Br- formed a bond there. You'll notice that if I do this under radical conditions, I see no rearrangements occurring. The bromine and the hydrogen both end up on this double bond, 
so as to give me the anti-Markovnikov product, that is the bromine attached to the external carbon. No rearrangements occur. This brings us to an excellent example problem. What will be the major product of the reaction of 2-methyl-2-butene with each of the following reagents? And please show the mechanisms. Now, as I'm going to answer these momentarily, you're welcome to pause the video first and attempt them on your own before proceeding. Let's take a look at the first one, reacting 2-methyl-2-butene with HBr under non-radical conditions. Here's our overall reaction. Treating this molecule, 2-methyl-2-butene, with HBr by itself under non-radical conditions. As you've seen in an earlier chapter, this is pretty straightforward. Pi electrons come out of this double bond and form a bond with that hydrogen and kick off this bromide. It's of course going to place the hydrogen at this position because that gives rise to the more stable tertiary carbocation. The Br- then comes in, forms a bond with that position, and gives me my final product indicated here. This should be very straightforward and familiar to you at this point. But what occurs if I react 2-methyl-2-butene and HBr under radical conditions, that is, adding peroxide and lighter heat? Well, as I've shown before, the first step that occurs is initiation. The peroxide molecule breaks apart homolytically, forming two individual oxygen radical molecules. In our first propagation step, one of these oxygen radicals combines radically with the hydrogen in HBr, kicking off the Br as shown here to form an alcohol and a Br radical. In my next propagation step, my Br radical now combines radically with one of the two pi electrons in this double bond. So which of these two carbon atoms is this bromine going to bond with? It's of course going to bond with this one right here. And the reason is because when it does so, it pumps the other single electron on to the more substituted carbon, giving me this more stable tertiary carbon radical. If the bromine had combined instead with the internal carbon, I would have ended up with a radical on this position, which would be the less stable secondary radical position. At the next step, this carbon radical will, will interact with a second molecule of HBr and form a bond radically with this hydrogen. Once again, these half-barb arrows are indicating that this hydrogen is stealing just one of these two electrons and walking away with it and then combining that electron with the single electron on this carbon to form a bond at this position. In the process, this bromine is going to walk away with the second electron in this HBr bond, ultimately giving rise to this product and a second molecule of bromine radical. You can imagine that in one of the termination steps, which I'm not showing, this bromine radical could combine, potentially, with a second molecule of bromine radical to make Br2, or with some of our other radicals in the solution to ultimately remove all radicals from the system. In our next question that I had from the lineup, I asked what would happen if I took the same molecule, 2-methyl-2-butene, and reacted with HCl under radical conditions. Now, I'm not going to show you the mechanism, but we'll just remind you of what I stated earlier. If you react this molecule under HCl, it just gives the same product that would occur under non-radical conditions. That is, the Markovnikov product. Once again, if you want to know why, you're welcome to consult page 482 of our text. An additional nuance in the world of radical chemistry deals with stereochemistry, or the three-dimensional configuration of the products. Radical addition reactions give totally racemic products. In other words, if I take a molecule like this and treat it with bromine under radical conditions, I'm of course going to get this as my major product. This is a stereocenter. However, I have to stress that this product is going to be formed with both enantiomers present in a 50-50 mixture, i.e. a racemic mixture as indicated in this picture here, both enantiomers being present. Why in the world does that occur? The reason is because at the first propagation step, the one in which a bromine forms a bond with our carbon radical, the bromine can just as easily form a bond on the top side of this carbon as it can with the bottom side of this carbon. And in fact, it will do both with just as much ease and prevalence. By doing so, it gives rise to both enantiomers, the one in which the bromine is pointing up as well as the one in which the bromine is pointing down. The same is true of doing radical reactions with Cl2 as well as HBr. You end up getting totally racemic products. All right, that feels like a good place for us to end this video. 
Please stay tuned for our next one in which I'll continue our discussion on radical chemistry. Until then, have an enjoyable rest of your day.